So good afternoon, colleagues, and I'm Jay Coakley from the University of Colorado here in Colorado Springs. Long time retired, but, but I'm still affiliated with them. And this, this particular session is, uh, the title has changed, Grassroots Sport in the United States and Italy. And, uh, and we will have uh, five presentations and uh, each one will be 10 minutes long. And then we'll have plenty of time for uh, questions and discussion and responses. And, and I just want to preface our, our session with with uh, by saying something related to what some other people have said during during the conference, uh, and they have assumed that everybody here loves sport, and they've said that a number of times. And 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 I I don't love sport. Uh, I have had many experiences in sport through my life. A number of them are enjoy have been enjoyable. Uh, some of them have not been enjoyable. And, and I continue to participate in, in things that some people might call sports, but they're closer to physical activities and informal games than, than sports. So, uh, so I, th I think that, that when you love sport, it's really hard to, to, to turn a critical eye toward it. And, uh, and our title, Grassroots Sports, uh, I think if we think about the term grassroots, it's of, by, and for the people. It's self-organized sports, uh, for the most part. They're self-sustaining, they're local. And all of those things, just like formerly organized sports, require resources. So, so there is, there's an underlying set of issues, uh, sociological issues related to social class and, and uh, race and ethnicity and gender that, that, that are related to what we're gonna talk about. And also, the term sport, um, we, ought, we should question what that means, too, because uh, we're talking about so-called grassroots participation, and that's much more, it's more recreationally oriented, and it's not necessarily designed to achieve excellence, win gold medals, uh, or, or just get better in a progressive way. Uh, I, I've, I've certainly... <laughs> okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I think that one of the problems with related to grassroots sports, and if there's someone back there who knows how to turn on the lights, that would be great. Uh, so one of the problems with grassroots sports is that people have this image of what sport should be in, in some cultures more than others, and they see sport uh, uh, inherently connected with, with uh, being successful in competition. And grassroots sports is not necessarily grounded in that, but they often uh, get co-opted and, and uh, changed uh, into formally organized sports. So our first speaker is uh, Chris Koster, and he is from the Ohio State University, and he has undertaken uh, a national sports and society survey, which has not been done in the United States since the 1980s. So, uh, so Chuck will lead off and talk about some of his data, and then we'll move to the other presenters. Now, Chuck, Chris. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jay. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here. We'll try to make do without being able to read our notes. Uh, it seems like uh, the movie has impinged our ability to see here uh, next door. Um, I guess I'll use uh, Jay's segue of uh, thinking about sports of, by, and for the people because really that's what my research endeavor is attempting to do, to see the extent to which that is holding true. Uh, and we don't have great information, as Jay alluded to, about that. So what I'm going to do today uh, is first off talk about um, 
the rationale and the, and the uh, usefulness of the National Sport and Society Survey. Uh, secondly, uh, at least introduce you to a number of the projects that we're involved in that use the data. Uh, and then finally provide some statistics about how adults and youth uh, are engaging in sports uh, as based in that survey uh, data. Uh, so first I need to recognize the generous support uh, provided for this uh, enormous research endeavor by uh, the OSU Sport and Society Initiative, the Center for Human Resource Research, really the survey arm uh, of the university, the College of Arts and Sciences, and, and literally thousands of people who helped not only test uh, the survey and, and uh, the quality of the data, but then um, the actual respondents themselves. Um, so, uh, first off, in, in, in terms of talking about uh, the dynamics of the survey and the usefulness of the survey, a number of things to, to note. It's a, this large, uh, multifaceted, comprehensive attempt to get information from 4,000 adults uh, about how they have engaged uh, with sports uh, throughout their lives, uh, and also information from parents of uh, a focal child between the age of 6 to 17 who lived with them as such a, uh, a child was present. So about 20% of the adult respondents did have a focal child. We have about 800 or so uh, cases of, of information from that intergenerational connection. Uh, like many surveys, uh, we are disproportionate uh, representation along a few demographic lines, most notably uh, it's disproportionately female, white, and from the Midwest. Now we anticipated some of that, uh, and uh, that's part of the reason why we have such a large uh, uh, sample size, is to cover some of these cells where uh, perhaps we wouldn't be as well represented as we anticipated. Also, uh, I've been engaged and just completed the first round of adult weights to weight the data so that we can provide uh, more accurate estimates of what's going on uh, throughout the U.S. In fact, we have information from people of, of every state, including the District of Columbia, uh, and so it is indeed a national sample. Uh, the focus of the survey and, and, and my thinking about it in terms of comprehensive sports information is then on sports involvement, including things like accessibility and interactions, expenditures, ideologies, um, and a host of dynamics uh, linked to well-being of individuals and society overall. Uh, the sample for the survey was drawn from uh, the po a new population panel from CHRR, again our, our survey research arm there at the university. Uh, as many people have found out, people don't answer their phone even for surveys anymore, so you're lucky to get even a 10% response rate. Uh, and this is really the, the wave of, of, of that survey research seems to be going with this population panel. It was a long uh, survey and uh, people committed um, a, a great deal of time and effort not only to create it, but to take it. Uh, over 450 on-screen questions took over an hour uh, to, to complete uh, on average. Uh, respondents were paid for participating. Uh, the target sample of adults were uh, folks ages 21 to 65, uh, excuse me, throughout the U.S. Uh, and then we have 800 or so uh, resident focal kids. Uh, why conduct the NSAS? Well, as, uh, I'm pre preaching to the choir here, but certainly the prominent and pervasiveness of sports, the intersections between sports and social issues, uh, as I've um, advocated and, and um, and Jay introduced uh, scarce data, especially in the U.S., on sports involvement patterns and interactions and how they're connected to other areas of life. Uh, and there's this opportunity for the survey, but also uh, the Sport and Society Initiative that I'm a part of, to really contribute to research and understanding of how people are involved in sports and why it matters in their lives. So the guiding framework for creating and um, analyzing the data was first to get better information about uh, essentially what people experience, what they do, uh, and the sorts of uh, things that they think about in regards to sports. Uh, to allow for essentially cultural analysis and, and criticisms uh, where we view sport settings and sites and interactions uh, as symbolic and revelatory uh, of what goes on in society. And third, you know, considering how the patterns of sports structures, cultures, and interactions uh, work in a society and how they're meaningful and uh, affect folks. Uh, with a goal of better understanding and improvement of how we do sports uh, in society. Uh, there are many aspects of the NSAS data that are unique. I'll touch on a few of them briefly here in terms of uh, some of the, the ways to demonstrate its comprehensiveness. We have a host of information about sport excel accessibility throughout one's lives, about dimensions here. I'm talking about watching and following versus uh, playing sports uh, and, and other different dimensions. Uh, different organizations of sports involvement. We have some unique information about uh, adults talking about mistreatment experiences in sport, ranging from uh, harassment and, and bullying and name calling to more uh, extreme physical and, and sexual forms of abuse, uh, injury histories in regards to sport uh, involvement, and, and a host of attitudes and ideologies that are linked to sports involvement, but also sports-related issue. 
And so the, the data were intentionally designed and mapped out to get information on the predictors, mechanisms, and effects of sports interactions. In addition to that, uniquely we have information from two generations and retrospective accounts from adults that allows us to, to do some quasi-longitudinal things with the cross-sectional data. So it offers in regards to studying sports information about public opinions and attitudes uh, linked to sports, current patterns on the part of adults uh, and uh, youth, uh, life histories of uh, what people have experienced, uh, life course changes if you look at the retrospective accounts of adults and how their life is, is now different than when they were growing up, and even some uh, evidence about generational changes. If, uh, you, you leverage the retrospective accounts of adults and, and match that up with uh, the contemporary experiences of the focal children. Uh, so from my standpoint, I'm particularly focused on the intersections uh, between sports involvement in health and well-being, economic resources, uh, cultural ideologies, uh, and a variety of different social patterns that exist. Uh, here in very small print, we'll give you a, a, an idea of the scope and scale of the way that we're using this data. Uh, you know, we already have uh, 30 projects up and running uh, from the data, uh, even though it's uh, just recently uh, finished data collection. They include uh, things like uh, patterns of adult and youth involvement in sports, links between sports involvement uh, and health, uh, sports consumption and fandom, and uh, a host of things about public attitudes uh, connected to sports. And obviously I can't do all this myself, and so part of the strategy here, and, and uh, I've been very gratified uh, with the receptiveness of, of uh, uh, organizing a host of different collaborators uh, from across uh, 10 different universities and um, uh, 20 plus uh, collaborators on these projects. Uh, and so uh, we're trying to make progress here. And emerging findings largely match up with a lot of uh, things that uh, we anticipate a finding with some nuance in terms of how context matters, in terms of links to health and well-being, inequalities in access, experiences, and attitudes, uh, and the salience of identities, values, and group memberships. Uh, to uh, briefly uh, page through a few of the, the unique uh, dimensions of, of sports involvement that we're able to get from the data, as well as some nature of some findings, uh, certainly in a, in a conference here about uh, athletes um, establishing their rights. I think I should at least give a couple overviews of a couple more salient public opinion questions about this. Uh, here's public opinion about whether or not college athletes should not be allowed to be paid as an athlete. And as you can see, and as people are particularly interested with the California law and uh, NCAA scandals, uh, we've, we've reached the 50% uh, support for athletes being allowed um, to be paid as athletes, uh, although there still is relatively strong support for amateur ideals, as you can see here. Uh, also, an, also another um, symbolic, really, uh, indicator of athletes' rights is, is questions about uh, ability to protest, uh, particularly in the U.S., uh, focus on ability to protest during the playing of the national anthem. Uh, and you can see that uh, a majority of folks uh, strongly disagree with the opportunity uh, to, for athletes to protest during the national anthem, but uh, the variance is, is pretty incredible across the different categories of response. Uh, turning towards uh, patterns of sports involvement, uh, some of the current patterns for adults, we see that over 60% of adults say that they've participated in a sport regularly over the past year. Uh, overwhelmingly, sports also re uh, adults uh, report watching or following sports, with only 14% say they haven't watched or followed sports, and uh, upwards of 35% of adults saying that they watch or follow sports every month of the past year. Uh, in terms of uh, looking at sports fandom, we see relatively high proportion of adults still identify as uh, quite a bit or um, very much so uh, sports fans, nearly uh, half of the, uh, of the population, in fact. And while there's some age-graded dynamics going on here, you can see that the parents are essentially reporting that their children aren't particularly um, uh, enthusiastic uh, sports fans, at least at this stage of their life. Uh, if we look at life histories, also a way to leverage the data from the NSAS, uh, we can see uh, on the left there the pie chart showing that 35% of adults uh, said that they have been mistreated in their sports interactions. Over 40% have been injured through sports interactions uh, with a quarter of, of the national population saying they've experienced a serious injury through their sports involvement. Obviously important to investigate in terms of the context of sports. Uh, we also have life history information for adult or for children's uh, experiences. So this is on the focal children. We can see uh, alarming to many people that 30% uh, of, of youth uh, have never played a sport regularly. Uh, and over half of youth have not played uh, organized sports uh, overall, at least at that stage in their life. 
We also uh, match up information consistent with other research about relatively high uh, rates of dropout. Again, this is age graded, but here we're seeing about 37%, closer to 50% about the older kids of the focal child, uh, children, but a substantial proportion who drop out do resume playing organized sports. Uh, according to their life histories, at least a quarter resume uh, participating in organized sports. We can also leverage the NSAS data to look at life course changes, adults talking about how often they thought about sports and identified in the as an athlete growing up as compared to now. You can see adults saying that they thought about sports in a typical week about 16 hours per week and now about nine hours per week on average. Uh, also a, a marked change in terms of how uh, adults versus when they were young think of themselves as an athlete obviously plays into how the meaning and the commitments of sports uh, change over the life course for most people. In terms of looking at generational changes, finally, uh, a statistic here about sport involvement changes uh, over generations. Again, leveraging the retrospective accounts, we can see the adults say that about 60% of them played organized sports while growing up. Uh, yet, as I reported now, it looks like about half of kids are not playing organized uh, sports uh, in today's uh, generation. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, this is just an opportunity to give you an overview of what we're doing with that Sport and Society uh, survey, uh, the, the numerous ways that I think it, it adds to uh, research knowledge and, and serious uh, social science uh, rigor. Overall, like all research, it does have some weaknesses, but a, a number of strengths that represent important steps forward. Uh, and I encourage you to contact me for further information uh, and collaboration inquiries and, and use of the data, uh, either due to your personal interests or academic interests or, or to write up what's going on in sports and society. Thank you. some of the people from outside the United States put this into context. Uh, we don't have a sport minister or a sport ministry, uh, no cabinet position, no way to gather data through at the federal national level uh, with, with funding from the, man, from the federal government. So, so Chris has, has really done a service and, and has coordinated a project that would take teams of people and in some other countries to do. So uh, we're anxious to see his data. So uh, this, the second presentation is by Stacy Warner from East Carolina University, and she will be talking about sport as medicine. Stacy. Thank you. I am Stacy Warner from East Carolina uh, University. I'm a professor of sport studies and sport management, and very glad you all could join us today. So my objectives for this session are for you to critically understand the need and value to challenge the common assumptions of sport, recognize how grounded theory research can inform sport, and finally, what you're probably most interested in is identifying strategies for creating high quality sport experiences that improve population health. <clears throat> so just a little bit of background, my research started out kind of challenging these five common assumptions of sport and these legitimations. Why do we ha even have sport? And my research over the past decade has really honed in on how sport can be used to build community. I kind of have done that for 10 years and looking to move on to a different one. And I went back to this um, Chalup, his justifications for sport, and I kind of honed in on health. I work within a kinesiology department and it seemed like a natural fit. What I found is people have assumed that sport promotes health, but we don't really know how and under what conditions sport actually promotes health. Guess what? A review of the literature says that an existing theory does not exist on how sport can promote health. That's great for somebody who does grounded theory research. Um, what the research does say is the link between athletes and binge drinking exists. There's a link between athletes suffering eating disorders, reporting higher levels of anxiety, suffering sport and recreation injuries. These are all things not great for our health. Then you look at the information concerning spectator sport and it doesn't look any better. Spectator sport increases sedentary activities, it competes with time playing sport, it encourages unhealthy eating and excessive alcohol consumption ever been to a tailgate at the Ohio State University, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So at this point, kind of two paths emerge. We can either stop investing in sport, and we can say we don't care about it anymore, let's just stop, or we can critically look at it and say, okay, how can we improve 
sport and how can it have an impact on population health? Chalup, one of my mentors, since I've cited him twice in this presentation, um, worked with him a long time, um, stated well over a decade ago, we know very little about the factors that currently inhibit or that could ultimately foster a stronger contribution to health by sport. Identifying those factors could help us build added value into sport that our organizations design and deliver. This is exactly where my research is going, so I'm just glad you said that. The research question was pretty simple and straightforward. How and under what conditions can sport promote health? For those interested, I used a grounded theory, bottom-up approach, getting data from the participants and seeing what they say. The data collection, I used a recreational setting. I feel like, feel very strongly that sport can learn from recreational settings. And while several may argue that this is not a sport, I'll make a good argument that it is and that sport managers can learn from it. Used observation and interviews as well to collect my data. The group I used is referred to as F3. It's a free peer-led um, workout group. They get together. As you can see, it started in 2015 with just five men. It quickly expanded to over 300 men and provided a great avenue for achieving health benefits. Interestingly enough, the city in which this group resides in has 25% living below the poverty line and over 70% are considered obese or overweight. So this was kind of a good context to look at. It's working in this context, it could work anywhere. These were my experts who I interviewed, not actually them, but sample. Um, there were 14 men aged 24 to 55, and this was the, the data showed, the results. And this was now published as a sport as medicine. You may have all heard of exercise as medicine. My argument is exercise doesn't work. It's not working. We still have an obesity problem. Why is it sport in the conversation? Um, Berg 2019 pointed out the almost complete absence of the word sport in US public health discourse. If you look at physical activity guidelines, they don't even mention the word sport up until very recently, actually. Um, so what this model showed is that there are three main factors that are needed to see that the participants are actually reaping health benefits. And they are creating a team structure, providing a place to be accountable, and ensuring no one is left out. And they led to physical, social, and mental um, outcomes. So the first one was creating a team structure. Again, this is kind of a taken for granted assumption that we have a team structure within our sport organizations, but this was really important to participant recruitment and retention. In this particular group, it was peer led and there was shared leadership and that was extremely important um, to these individuals. It really had the group workout mentality and teamwork, the idea that there's a common goal. Those things created that team structure that was really important to seeing that health outcomes were achieved. The next one was providing a place to be accountable. This was a great quote from one of the participants as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. This is a place where men were fed humble pie and hold one another accountable to being better men, not just in regards to their physical health. And this group really encourages you to be a better person, better husband, and better father. What this group did was at the end, they took five minutes at the end of their workout, and they got together to share concerns. Prayers, whatever it was, they all got together in a group, shout outs, whatever they needed to do, but it provided a social space for people to be held accountable. The only kind of culture that was created was that people were transparent and that they were honest, and that they were open. That's all they ask. Then finally, ensuring no one is left out. This group really made sure that everyone was welcome. It didn't matter who or what showed up at 5.30 in the morning. If somebody showed up, they were instantly greeted and welcomed into the group. They were given a nickname, and they were part of that group. Um, they have modifications of their workout, so anybody can participate. And this example of our mission is to give it away. It's anybody's workout, 
and that was communicated throughout the entire organization, so it was open. Again, keeping in mind that this is a free group, I think that there's a lot of things that sport organizations can learn from that. And if we can implement those three things, we'll see the health outcomes. Physical health outcomes were obvious. Anytime there's an increase in physical activity, you're going to see some health outcomes. The mental toughness was another one um, that we saw. They really talked about how they just felt more mentally stable and they were prepared for their day. And then the social connections was really, really relevant for this particular group. A lot of them talked about how men don't necessarily have an outlet to share and their friends are limited to their wives, husbands, their wives, friends, husbands, or their old college buddies. It was very uncommon for them to make new connections. And that's really important whenever you're thinking about health benefits and achieving those. So the so what? So are we creating team structures within our, within our sport organizations? Are we creating shared leadership? Is it really a genuinely peer-led organization? And if not, how can we do that more? Are we providing a place to be accountable? If you think about the local, uh, the office water cooler where people can just gather around, do we have that social space within our sport organizations for people to actually talk to one another and to share what's going on? This organization purposely created it. And what's interesting is I think that we do that at the youth level. We think about how we can build character into our sports programs and how we can teach integrity. But why does that drop off once we get to adulthood? The men that I interviewed clearly needed that and clearly wanted that. They wanted the bar to be raised and to be held to a higher standard. How can we create that in our sport organizations? And then finally, ensuring no one's left out. How can the doors be open to sport more? What can we do to make sure individuals with disabilities or individuals that may not run as fast or that have an injury can still continue to participate? This group did modifications and things like that. And again, they were welcoming to everybody. And what we saw was that led to clear health outcomes. So just to end real quick, um, we need to think about sport differently. And we need to not just think about the youth level. There's a need in, in the US society and worldwide to keep people participating in sport. We all wanna keep our jobs, right? So we need more people participating. That stat of 60% adults participating actually shocked me, but um, interesting stuff. We need even more people participating, and this is a contribution that I think that sport and sport managers can really make to solving um, this obesity epidemic and health problems that are out there. All right, and there's my contact information. Reminded while Stacy was talking that the grassroots sports comes in, I'm not gonna say infinite, but but a large number of number of forms. And 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 we know so little about this. I'm a sociologist and been studying sports for 45 years, and and most of our research goes on the formally organized uh, sport programs, and we don't know much about what I call people sports. Sports that have been created by uh, for the people. And and uh, as Stacy has pointed out, this is one particular example, and we probably can't make a lot of generalizations from this particular example to other kinds of grassroots participation. Okay. Stacy's connected it with health, which is what you have to do in the United States if you want funding. So, um, because, because funders are not concerned with grassroots participation, they are concerned about health. So, uh, our next presentation is by Simon Leeson, and he will talk about, I think, from Washington State and Slovenia, and in the summer times, China, and he will talk about teaching our children well. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the nice introduction. My presentation may be a bit of an odd fit in this section on grassroots sports. Maybe the scheduler was misled. For those of you who are not familiar, the title of the presentation is actually a citation from a song by Crosby, Steele's Nash and Young, Teach Your Children Well. Um, the children, in our case, are not 
real children, but they are university students, so a less poetic but more descriptive title uh, might be sustainability in sport management education. Um, and uh, still, let me try to make it work uh, worth your while, um, and hopefully it will not be uh, too much of a stretch. I coordinate the sport management program at Washington State University, um, and this research is co-authored by my colleague there, uh, Scott Jedica, who's currently otherwise engaged could not be here, but he sends his best. Uh, Scott is the one on the left in this picture. <laughs> now, the Play the Game conference has styled itself as the home for the homeless questions in sport, um, and consistently high attendance from a variety of stakeholders um, indicates that the conference is indeed reaching many participants. Um, but inevitably, uh, many people who couldn't who could not, but perhaps should participate, um, are left out, so we set to examine to what extent are the ideas, the solutions, and the expertise gathered at this conference passed on to future generations of sport professionals. Um, also in an era when concerns over sustainability and climate change are so prevalent that a 16-year-old from Sweden can mobilize the world, uh, we set off to explore to what extent are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals integrated into sport management education uh, at American universities. Um, to this end, we analyzed the curricula and the program descriptions and the student learning outcomes for 84 graduate programs, that is master's and doctoral programs, uh, in sport management at 65 major American universities. Um, and so let me skip the methodological intricacies and rather present some main, some main findings. If anyone is interested in the methodological intricacies, we can obviously come back to it later. Um, the greatest likelihood of finding content related to Play the Game's goals is to, prob is to look into courses in sport sociology and sport ethics, which appeared at 39 of the universities which we examined, so that is about 60% of the um, uh, universities we examined. Uh, these courses often introduce students uh, to concepts such as equality, the role and the importance of youth sport, good governance and ethics, to, of course, um, and depending on the course textbook, uh, and the instructor's inclination, they may also touch on the causes of poverty, on the causes of, heavy, of, of uneven access to participation opportunities, which has also been a play the game priority over the past uh, uh, multiple editions. Um, and again, still depending on the textbook and on the instructor, uh, these courses may also touch on uh, sport as a vehicle for education, sport to promote development and peace, to foster democracy and freedom of expression, and more. Um, however, it seems, as if, it seems as if the topics that are most likely to capture student interest are the topics perpetuated by mass media. The American, soccer national, the American women's soccer national team's demands for equal pay, for instance, or Colin Kaepernick's protest of the American flag and the responses of various stakeholders to it. Uh, as well as some other topics which, coincidentally, Chris actually uh, mentioned in his presentation earlier in the context of public opinion polling. Uh, these topics are certainly important. It is obviously very right to discuss them, uh, but they're not the only important topics. Uh, the, the discussion of Nike's award-winning two-minute commercial um, with one of the company's primary target audiences, which are university students, in university classrooms is perhaps a triumph for the advertising industry more than for education or for sport. Um, and of course we can only hope that the instructors truly elevate these conversations beyond the level customarily observed in television talk shows or in podcasts. Um, outside of these and a few other topics, however, uh, there seems to be relatively little talk of the role of sport for development in various types um, of communities, especially in an international context. Um, I figured I would add a slide on youth sport as something that is uh, pertinent to uh, grassroots sports and something that was brought up by the previous presenters. Only two universities offer courses specifically um, focused on youth sport. Two universities out of 65. I will just leave it there. Um, even though the majority of sport management graduates probably end up working in 
Department of Parks and Recreation type of settings, so YMCA type of settings. Uh, what about the Sustainable Development Goals? Well, we are, educa are we educating students for uh, 2030? Now, one thing that emerged from our analysis is a focus on globalization and economic growth. One in three universities offer courses specifically focused on the international or global nature of sport, and one in 10 uh, universities, so that is only six universities, uh, even incorporate globalization or international aspects into their program description of or learning outcomes. Um, however, with very few exceptions, these courses seem to teach students how to expand their markets and do business uh, at a global level, perhaps promoting more of a neoliberal approach to globalization, uh, rather than promoting global codependence, cooperation, and even solidarity, uh, which is actually the spirit of the Sustainable Development Goals. And again, and if anyone has missed the memo on what exactly the Sustainable Development Goals are, I'm happy to uh, try to explain to them in 15 seconds uh, in the uh, questions and uh, discussion time. Um, only isolated cases of which um, I have taken the liberty of including two examples there indicate that sport can be conceived and taught, that globalization and sport can be conceived and can be taught um, differently. Um, only, about, only about seven programs, again, out of 85 programs, or 84 programs at 65 universities, uh, explicitly referenced sport for development and peace in their curricula or in their program description. By the, by the way, the, uh, the, the young man standing next to Ian Sanderson in this picture, uh, he is Bob Monroe, and he's the winner of the 2015 Play the Game Award for his uh, excellent work with Matare FC in Kenya, speaking of sport for development and peace. We give award to people who actually work in this field. Um, and we highlighted one example over there, uh, which incorporates sport for the prevention of violence in its program objectives. Again, an indication that, sports, uh, that sport management education can be done, can be conceived differently. Um, and finally, climate change and environmental sustainability, which are um, arguably one of the greatest challenges currently faced by humanity, uh, seem to be rarely discussed by educators in sport management. Only five programs offer courses, all are elective, uh, on climate and sustainability as it pertains to sport and or recreation management. Um, so again, it's, uh, it's again an, an example from the um, University of Tennessee Knoxville um, program description there, and one wonders to what extent it really reflects uh, the way we educate students. Um, now, many may claim that sustainability is discussed in sport marketing courses as an aspect of corporate social responsibility. Uh, but the expert consensus about the magnitude and pace of climate change suggests it has become insufficient to deal with the topic as a subtopic within one chapter discussed in one course, um, especially as anecdotal evidence uh, seems to indicate that students actually know very little about this. I can share the results of an informal survey later. Um, I uh, included a quote by Madeline, uh, I included an observation by Madeline Orr there, um, and according to her, sustainability, or I guess within the spirit of her comment, sustainability should either be covered across most courses in a curriculum or simply be allocated a standalone course. It would not hurt if it would be, uh, if it would be a core one. Um, and paradoxically, this seems to be an aspect where the industry, where practitioners seem to be ahead of education. Olympic hosts have been developing sustainability plans for over 20 years. Um, UEFA, the European Soccer Federation, recently announced they would plant 600 trees to offset some of the carbon emissions from next year's continental championship in 12 countries. Let this resonate for a second. Some of the emissions, because 600,000 trees will not suffice to offset all the emissions generated by one turn. So what are we supposed to take away from this presentation? Um, most graduate programs in sport management seem to be um, very concerned with preparing students with successfully transitioning into the workforce, but with little regard for the challenges that uh, students and well, 
societies really face today. Uh, some may argue that it is still too early to incorporate these sustainable development goals. They actually grew out of a previous initiative that was um, introduced in 2000. Um, but um, um, more importantly, um, again, practitioners have been talking about this for a while. The first Olympic Games uh, to have, uh, to have um, incorporated a sustainability and legacy plan dates back to 1994 in Lillehammer in Norway, perhaps not coincidentally, uh, before today's graduates were even born. Um, I believe the first city to reject an Olympic Games that they had won the rights to organize was Denver in 1971. That was before I was born. But then again, Jay can talk more about this because I believe he was involved in it, not because he was already around back then. Um, so perhaps, uh, you know, educators may be forgetting that we, are pre that we should be preparing students for 2030 and beyond. And perhaps many, perhaps even most programs, seem to be lagging between 20 and 50 years behind. Um, unfortunately, this long-standing compromising attitude will only mean that um, the failure to acknowledge the need for wholesale change will only require much greater and much more disruptive and radical change later. This is, I think, what we are supposed to take away. Uh, how can we incorporate the good things that we talk about here um, into education, into practice, keeping in mind that education does not stop when one earns a degree. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I doubt that anybody who's teaching in sport management has ever had a student come up to them and say, I'm in sport management because I want to get into grassroots sports. So, uh, and, and that's, that's part of, of the, the uh, point that I, that I think is underlying our discussion here, is that grassroots sports has really been uh, marginalized, just like intramurals have been marginalized in, in U.S. high schools and, and in, in many universities. So their, their afterthoughts, their side, side uh, activities, they're, they're not the focus of things. So uh, Simone raises those issues. So our next presentation is uh, by Manuel Agamba and Nikki Mandelesi from Italy. They're secondary school teachers, yes. And, uh, and they have come here on their own dime, we say in the United States. They have no external funding, but they're here to meet people, to, to talk about creative ideas uh, related to involvement in, in grassroots participation. So take advantage of them uh, after this session and pick their brains about what they're doing. So, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you for the, uh, this meeting uh, and uh, oh, sorry, okay. to the play the game uh, to invite us uh, for this uh, opportunity. I, I want to say good afternoon to all of you. And uh, uh, as uh, Jay said, uh, we are coming from Italy. I introduce a little one uh, our uh, uh, our, uh, we are teaching, uh, we are coaching, uh, we are educators, we are volunteers, and uh, here we, are, we don't want to represent uh, uh, the school because uh, the school didn't pay us uh, anything. <laughs> and uh, so we decided to, uh, to be freelance and, uh, uh, because we believe, uh, we believe in this. And uh, we are coming from uh, from Rome, from Italy, and uh, at this moment, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm I'm dressing the Gryffindor <laughs> Gryffindor uh, dress uh, because uh, we invite uh, all of us uh, to uh, come on the at this uh, uh, magic uh, journey uh, with uh, Harry Potter. We use uh, um, the Harry Potter as the right stimulus to involve. Uh, youth and, and also adult. We combine the magical story of Harry Potter and the power of role playing and uh, the social, the, to finalize, uh, social uh, well-being for all. Welcome to the journey. 
Many, many times we heard about causes and effects uh, about uh, sedentarity. The slide up, uh, you can see uh, the variables that we discuss upstream the idea. We can appreciate the social attitude variables and the new neurosizing variables. A lot of these are on community competencies. In America, you love Chiara Ferragni, no? Uh, Chiara, is it true that Chiara Ferragni drink collagen and uh, she say drink collagen is good for your skin? She had nowadays a huge influence against scientific community that obviously say what's wrong with you? It, uh, it has a bad relapse in the well-being behavior of a single. The effects are multiple, metabolic and psychological diseases, our lifestyle diseases, also between the, uh, the social relationship. Physical activity becomes primary to change bad, be uh, bad eating habits, to improve self-esteem, to build a lifestyle linked to the well-being. Also, also, it is essential for improving cognitive function in development age. Play the game is the way which represent the right stimulus to involve uh, in a voluntary engine gap of well-being and that will become good behaviors our against sedentary in adulthood. We are Italian, we are maybe one of the, the most creative culture in the world. Thinking about art during different periods in history, the moda and the mafia also. I said mafia, I do. Yes, because creativity is the, the lifestyle, it is the life skill essential in the problem solving. We haven't time to spend telling about the single activities, but the genetics don't lie. A lot of fun uh, to spend playing the game, but uh, we are friend, we are five scientists, and uh, uh, our job is linked the practice to the knowledge. There are the this past, the, these are the past of uh, our project. Moving experience, moving experience, echo. This proposal was made for acquired well-being in movement, well-being together in a natural environment. The concept of the of experience is different to concept of activity. Activity should be sporting and recreational. Experience is the time spent with the, the deep on in ourselves. The intervention linked to have fun playing, to appreciate the environment, to create social and mutual collaboration. Each model identified by an animal and the kind of movie of it. The second satellite idea was the parabens conferences. After the Olympic Games in Rio, we proposed the, some intervention in some schools linking to the concept of the Olympic spirits, sports and living value, the concept of volunteers, what mean in Italy to be uh, Paralympic and not VIP as Peredica Peregrini or Cristiano Ronaldo. All motivated thanks to the Brazilian music. We proposed at school three years of project. After Murray in experience, today I would introduce what we did on uh, uh, new in this year. I'm introducing an Harry Potter and the play in and the role play game. We transformed the concept for experience in shared experience to work with the, the entire single class. The importance was to share the idea with the one with the other professor. The introduction of psychologics uh, helping the discussions, the multiple purposes of the role-playing game, the right stimulation given to thanks Harry Potter and uh, his, his sample. I took, I took no large-scale data, but uh, the analysis uh, of a random class for try to explain some important focuses about physical activity and well-being work. This is an example class of a professional institute with a sportive uh, curvature. If you look the graphic, you can observe something wrong yet. 
The class is, is composed by uh, diversities, including disabilities, learning disabilities, disadvantaged family situation, adopted and LACYP. I mean the first focus is on diversity. My friend, Professor Hagrid, say unity, unity is strength, diversity is strength, diversity is normality. I would move the attention to one of the fundamentals of the education and health, the protocol modality. Obviously, it is wrong at the origin. Diversity is the truth of each of us. The magic Julio Velasco put the idea to work on single to create a group identity on the top of his work. That's why we choose uh, the sociogram of Moreno to start the analysis it represents the interpersonal relationship within a class group. Professor Rupin say, unicity need respect. So the sociogram of Moreno is the first variable to choose the uh, composition of the class houses. This, okay. The second variable is uh, the light and shovel card uh, taken from the book of Tolkien. It needs to create an emotional avatar spending 18 points between light and shadow. Also, we use this card to control between uh, the activities. I would remember that emotions in anatomy are hormones. Endocrinology system is the deepest prehistoric system who uh, were honored of its fundamental in our life. The third variable also is from Tol uh, Tolkien books. We used the information uh, taken before to choose houses between the different dots and the fats of the different houses. We found a sitting of Moreno that say the rule is the operational form to individual takes as a response of a given situation. We consider the role-playing game an holistic model that combines acquisition of relation, relational skills and the image of ourselves. So, the experience we talked before can, uh, can move body, mind, emotions, and group lift. Professor McGranick said, to know how to be, knowing, knowing how to do. Finally, social and individual objectives can be achieved. The sixth experience following this model is for first, movie watching and relative cine forum, Second, the particularity of this model uh, was that we proposed creative games inspired to the different stories of the uh, first four movies of Harry Potter and their relative symbols. Third, circle time strengthened that thanks to the team of psychologists. Fourth, a questionnaire and healing potion to recover absent and unwells. Each experience involves the acquisition of points for commitment, participation, creativity, and skills. Malus are recorded with the healing portion. Also, points are removed for unjustified absent and or disciplinary notes. The treasure is made of the sum of the points achieved thanks to the participation of the components of the house. It means that we create a sense of belonging, educationally positive against the dropout school. You can note that all of these components of the game are taking into account the problematics in education and work on it. The planning of the year concerns a period of analysis following the experience. A nice movement a nice moment was the Tolkien net. It was exactly as the as in the movie. Thanks at the data emerged in Moreno and like the shadow analysis. Also, Harry Potter as the right stimulus was used for the other professor as a winning key to teach better the hound matter. It was very important to find a common positive way to go together. At the end of the project, we verified improvement in participation, motivation, and values, deep in friendliness, listening and attention skills, relationship between students and professors, surfacing silent students and positive leaders, 
resides the glass climate generate significance for build the right reality, inclusion, the diversity, sociality and collaboration sense. And Peter, remember me that uh, also we improved the effect of sedentarity we taking we talked before. In the new year that coming, we will uh, contact the best protagonists for social well-being inspection. Sorry. And uh, probably issue emerges. Very hope, but mission impossible to expand this method at the Italian Ministry of Education, Sport, or CONI as well. That nowadays are desaparecidos, lost in the track 934. We are here today, so we will seek partners for shared practical to join theories, expand the sport field mentality, balance it with managing. Also, we contact more human resources because this mentality needs attention. Okay, we we have the challenge uh, final, and uh, I I would like to ask uh, you to to, to question. Uh, Considering the change of a human mind from analogical mind to digital mind, we ask, first, what makes the human human? And second, the great sport events and the professional elite sport are perhaps not distancing us from the primitive need of the movement, which is pleasure, and emotion. Thank you. Thank you. So I like the way that I did on pleasure and emotion, and uh, that's one of the things that we forget in a lot in a lot of our research. And uh, and they, uh, Manuela and Nikki have identified a key aspect of grassroots sports, and that is play and imagination. And and too often in our societies, uh, uh, post-industrial societies, play is seen as a waste of valuable time, and even among children. So, uh, so we have to organize things, and grassroots is is trying to pull that back and and incorporate play and imagination into activities of, of people of all ages. So, uh, our last participation is by Thomas Heiker who is at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs, and he will be talking about welcomeness in sport. Obviously, welcomeness is, is a key uh, uh, prerequisite for participating in just about anything. So, uh, Thomas will talk about how, how it's related to sport. Great. Thank you so much, Jay. And you kind of articulated that well, because as uh, one of the threads that I listened to all the presentations is that welcomeness is extremely important. And if you don't feel welcome into doing something that you're not likely going to engage in it. So the precipitous of this uh, research that we did um, started off with kind of similar to some of the other presentations, looking at the obesity epidemic worldwide. Um, in the United States culture, we just assume it's us, but it's not really just us. It's actually a world epidemic in terms of obesity. Um, we are getting larger and larger as we get older, et cetera. And so one of the things that the CDC has come out against and said that we need to really develop active communities and engage in healthy lifestyle, engage in healthy behaviors. And as in Stacy's presentation, what she mentioned is that typically what we look at is commercialized sport rather than sport for free, sport for engagement, sport for development, or um, some of the other aspects. So it's very important that we also think about not just commercialized sport, but how we can engage in sport more broadly to achieve the, achieve the health outcomes that we hope for. Um, the last part there is that as we age, we also change our sport behaviors. We either completely discontinue our sport participation, or we go from youth within which we engage in a lot of team-based sport or organized-based sport, and then we start to engage in very individual-based sport or at least um, partner-based sports. So thinking of things like running, cycling, triathlon from an individual perspective, but then thinking about uh, sports such as tennis, golf, 
um, even pickleball, one of the fastest growing sports in the United States, as um, partner-based sport, because typically you would play with someone else rather than by yourself. However, what we don't really talk about in this research is what does that mean from a race perspective and how does race play into our access to sport and how we understand sport and how we consume sport. We know from all of the research out there that there's tremendous disparities in participatory behaviors of sport as well as health disparities and outcomes related to lack of participation in sport or at least lack of active lifestyle. Um, so that leads us to the purpose of this study, which is to look at racial differences in perceived welcomeness and self-advocacy to participate in sports. And I'll define both of those for you and then go through the data that we collected. So the first thing is welcomeness. And welcomeness is exactly what the word sounds like in a lot of ways. It's just going to a place in where you feel as if you belong. So you feel connected to that. Within sport, in terms of the racialization of sport, we find that there are three aspects that delimit that welcomeness among different populations. The first of which is discrimination. So discrimination is where you don't, you're not allowed access to the sport simply based on your race. Um, this sounds like a very dated reference. However, there are still lots of research that articulates where people aren't allowed access to a sport, or even within that sport, they are put into certain positions based on their race um, or other characteristics. The second one is the institutionalization of it. Uh, there are some initiatives such as the MLB's RBI initiative, where they're trying to counterbalance the institutionalization of sport. So what that means is that if you live in an inner city culture, it's less likely you have access to participate in baseball because through institutionalized norms, they've moved those parks and recs out into suburban neighborhoods where it's more apt that people would actually engage in a sport such as baseball, whereas if you're in an urban community, you may find more basketball hoops and hardtop courts, etc. So that's the institutionalization that leads us to certain sports. And then the last one is socialization of, into sport. Um, and some of my other research is actually into running uh, and endurance participation in particular. And we looked at African American runners and some of the reasons of why they don't engage in that. Because clearly Africans can run well, they win all of the marathons, including just finished under two hours. So it's a sport that they do engage in. However, through our data and the collection, we found that their familial uh, socialization into sport is actually, if they do get into the sport of running, it tends to be 800 and less, not 800 meters and more. Um, so they want them to be sprinters because that's the flashy, showy, et cetera, sport, and that's why they want to engage in it as opposed to endurance um, sport in itself. So there has been some work in this area of welcomeness, and I apologize for the long list of sports here, and there's another page as well. Um, so Philip and Chanu are the two people who started this line of research, and as you'll see, it's very dated. It's 20 years old at this point. Um, but it does kind of fit along with some of our stereotypes around certain sports, etc. So um, the second set gets to the early 2000s. So this is the last set. So Shanu Floyd and Perry were the last ones to look at it. And these were more leisure based. So while there are sports in, in, within their data, it wasn't all about just sports. So we're highlighting um, all of the things that were different in terms of what people felt welcome to participate in. So this, these, all of these studies just looked at welcomeness and did not include self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is an individual's belief in their capacity to execute behaviors necessary to participate in that sport. So what that simply means is how confident are you to be able to do it? And the way that we learn this confidence is through practice, through access, through participatory behaviors, etc. Um, so the more you engage in an activity, the more you learn about the activity, the more confident you are going to be able to in performing that activity. Um, and what we'll find in a second is that that becomes important in terms of our grassroots participation because we'll see that there is a discrepancy between the two. Um, so we will find that people are confident, but they're not very welcome. Um, so what we did in terms of this data collection, we looked at, um, we've collected over a five-year period two different data sets. Um, and we only measured four universities within the United States. Um, and we measured their perceived welcomeness, their perceived self-efficacy in 14 different sports. And they were the most popular sports sanctioned by the National Federation of High School Athletics. Um, and then the last part we asked was demographics. So, our universities were located southeast, midwest, northeast, and southwest. 
Um, you can see the male-female breakdown was pretty good. And important to our data collection, almost, the, almost everyone actually played a score. Um, so in terms of understanding who they are and what they did, that's also important. We did have, unfortunately, a very high representation of white Americans, but they were all PWIs, so, um, sorry, predominantly white institutions. Um, so that's why we have an overrepresentation of that. So, getting into the perceived welcomeness. Um, I tried to figure out a thousand ways to make this graphically or visually appealing and understandable and digestible. Um, so simply what you can see is that blue is the white respondents, orange is the African American respondents, and gray would be the Hispanic Latino respondents. Um, so across the board, it looks like, for the most part, whites are fairly welcome in almost every score. So there's two ways to kind of interpret this data. One is the differences in the bars between the races, but then two, the midpoint is four. So anybody that's over four, or the average being over four, means that it's predominantly a feeling of welcomeness in that score. So again, white Americans in the United States tend to be very welcome. But if you look at other sports, gymnastics, lacrosse, swimming, um, and uh, field hockey, as well as cross country, Latinos are much far below, right? Um, in terms of African Americans, basketball, football were the ones where they perceived the most welcomeness, uh, as well as track and field, but not as high on cross country compared to track and field, so that gets into the discrepancy of short distance versus long distance. Um, so then the second thing we ask, and this is really interesting within the data, is how confident are you in playing these sports or participating in these sports? So we see a big increase in everybody's self-confidence to be able to participate. So we know that there's at least a willingness and a confidence to participate. However, they're not as welcome to participate, which becomes important. So what does that mean for our gra grassroots sport organizations? When we think about this, we need to start to concentrate on creating welcoming environments. And we need to start to understand different cultures and different people who come from different aspects and different organizations. And I don't want to pick on Stacey's organization, I didn't see any demographic data, but the photos that she showed was predominantly white men. So that automatically eliminated most races and it automatically eliminated all women. So how welcoming is that environment? Now their design was very different, very purposeful, so that's an acceptable separation of individuals. But if we're looking at a sport for all perspective, then we really need to understand those cultural boundaries, cultural differences, and design our sport organizations, and especially our community sport organizations, accordingly. Um, and that also leads to the second point, which is what sport you choose is very important. Um, so if you're trying to engage certain individuals beyond sport, so sport for development within the individual, as particularly in the youth organization, selecting sports that are important to them, which they automatically feel welcome to participate, and they feel confident to participate in, would help them join that organization more quickly, and probably have a lot more growth um, and development more efficiently. And then the last part is, once you have your organization, developing that welcoming culture. The one thing that, in Stacy's presentation, she did talk about is that people really, truly felt welcome to participate in that organization. So much so that they were sharing things with people in that community that, that they would not normally share. And that's something when we think about our community sport organizations in general, that's something we should create for all of our participants, regardless of the sport, the context, or their racial background. Thank you. talking about are going to be increasingly important as global migration continues around the world and as stereotypes get formed in connection with that migration. Now, the U.S. has a unique history, as all countries do, when it comes to racial and ethnic stereotypes. But even when the stereotypes fade, the legacy of those stereotypes is around for two or three generations. So, uh, and, and that affects uh, a sense of welcomeness in any, in any uh, sector, but in, in uh, grassroots sports, especially uh, being informally organized, uh, is, is very important. So now we have time for questions. And, and uh, just being familiar with sport organizations around the world, there's not an organization that I know of that's not interested in grassroots participation. And that's because they, they want a bigger pool of potential uh, high performance athletes athletes who will become high performance, and they also want people watching the television so that their ratings go up. But, uh, but there are other reasons for, mass, for grassroots participation. 
So any questions are welcome. Uh, we can direct them to the panelists, the specific panelists, if you would. Sure, Dave, thanks. Uh, this is more for, for Tom, but everybody else can, can talk about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Dave Ridpath from Ohio University. This is more for Tommy, um, as I always forget. Um, I think what's interesting looking at your graphics, is, I guess it's more of a statement, Tommy, but uh, not really a question. I want to see if you agree or maybe this is another way you could go, but even at HBCUs, and for those of you that aren't familiar, that's historically black colleges and universities, some of those sports that are up there at the HBCUs are played by predominantly white athletes at an HBCU. And I'm curious what you think, Tom, I mean, is that also a barrier from a welcoming perspective, maybe not so much from an efficacy. I think, like you said, your data show, data show that people feel they can do it. But even on a campus that is made up of people that primarily look like you, so to speak, uh, we know that PWIs present some barriers for, for minorities. Would the opposite, or is the opposite happening at HBCUs? Yeah, I've been, um, my dad taught at Storkel Black College and University in Durham. Um, I do know that, I have to tell you. Is that better? I'll just talk to the loud. Um, so he taught at a historically black college university with a football coach there. Um, their baseball team was predominantly white or Hispanic. Their golf team, I was actually recruited to play on and I barely played golf. Um, and so there is still that disconnect. I think in the literature you do find a lot about role modeling and, and perceptions of access. So as you were speaking, if you see individuals participating in that sport who look like you, then you're automatically more apt to join that. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure. I haven't seen any research on it, so it'd be an interesting way to go about it, in particular from the student population. Absolutely, okay. Here, first, and then my, my microphone works. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, just kind of chiming off that, uh, Jenna Ortega from USA Field Hockey. Uh, just wanted to ask if you and your research, uh, looking obviously, it's more welcoming when you see other, you know, your peers who look like you. What about in leadership positions or admins, uh, recruiting people of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, and how that can influence the growth and the welcomeness of the kids and athletes. Yeah, leadership and coaches is extremely important in terms of um, where you choose to participate. Um, there's been some other research in particular around basketball and youth sport that looks at the head coach and then the composition of the team. And there is a direct line between if it's a white head coach or if it's an African American head coach and what the composition of the team looks like. If it's an African American coach, it's almost 100% African American, whereas if it's a white head coach, it's about 50-50 or less. Um, so there's different. There's definitely some role modeling and some selection behavior there. We haven't in our research. We have not gotten into the strategies of how to engage more. This is the beginning of it in terms of is it really an issue? Is it still an issue? Because we do believe it's an egalitarian society right now, so we're all welcome to do anything. But clearly, stereotypes still exist around our sport participation that we need to break down. Yeah. And, and Chris has some data, uh, as, you, as you probably would imagine, on, on this. So Chris, you jump in. Yeah, I'm happy to, to chime in. Uh, so there's a number of aspects of welcomeness and um, uh, integration that we uh, attempt to get at uh, with the NSAS survey. Part of it is uh, getting information about how integrated or uh, not integrated uh, people are in their sport experiences across a variety of different dimensions, including uh, race, ethnicity. Uh, one thing specifically uh, to what Tommy has been talking about that I'm engaged in that's particularly fascinating along these lines is I'm collaborating with some folks in uh, Minnesota who study youth sports there, and um, their qualitative uh, data um, is suggesting some evidence that um, the welcomeness is uh, particularly meaningful uh, for parents of different racial ethnic groups. So we've talked about administrators and coaches and the athletes themselves. And one aspect of sport that I'm particularly interested in is, is the parent aspect of it. Uh, and so parents and the culture around parenting uh, is an important uh, thing to consider when uh, you're thinking about uh, welcomeness or not. And the final thing I'll say uh, is uh, we also have uh, uh, specific questions about welcomeness as it regards to 
uh, LGBT athletes. And so I'm engaged in a couple of studies that looks at uh, gender and sexual minorities and uh, their experiences of participating and dropping out and, and feeling welcome and, and mistreated in sport experiences. Okay, next question, yeah. Was, go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Carissa Conrad. I'm coming from Purdue University, and I have a question for Stacy. Um, I study health communication, so um, I was really fascinated by your research, and I really appreciate that grounded theory approach. I do have a question about um, how you or your participants were defining health, um, especially in terms of physical health. Often, I know the research suggests that sometimes in organized sport and outside of organized sport, we see a conflation between health and other things like high level performance or um, improve it, improvement over time or even aesthetics. So I was hoping to hear some specific examples of um, how you saw physical health improve um, as an outcome. Yeah. Great question, first of all. Um, I really, tried to stay true to grounded theory and let them define health for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, some talked about, there was a slide up there, I don't know if I kept it up long enough, that 10 minutes was really short, um, but some talked about they were using um, asthma medication, they, they noticed they could stop using it. Mm -hmm. um, I did have some more scientific people that talked about my body fat went down and things like that. Um, there's some quotes in there talking about going to the, a cardiologist and him taking them off medication. So they defined it very broadly, um, but there's a lot of good quotes um, in the actual paper that I let them define it for themselves. And those were just, I called it physical health because all the themes kind of fell under there. One more question over here. Thank you. Uh, Colin Hilton with the Utah Olympic Legacy Foundation. Um, question back to Stacy. Um, it's amazing to me that there isn't more research in connecting sport to the health, downstream health benefits. And I'm curious to see, or curious to uh, hear if you are seeing a tipping point. Are we there? Because as Jay astutely put, we see it in donors who will help in grassroots sports programming because of the perceived health benefits, but if there isn't those research studies and that those type of statistics, that hurts the cause. So I'm, I'm curious to see if you see a trend changing here in the United States of more research in universities and others getting the funding to be able to do that. So, um, great, another great question. Um, the, the last thing I saw, maybe Jay can help me out with this, but there was just a youth sports survey. Are you familiar with that? I'm not sure which one. Okay, there was a youth sports survey that just came out two weeks ago, and it was an executive order. It was the first time I saw an executive order actually mention the word sport um, in it and to learn more about youth sport. So I just read that report not too long ago. Um, that gives me hope that people are talking about it at kind of a government um, higher level. So I think there's promise out there. I think the more that we can connect sport to health, the better off we'll be, the more credibility. But we have a lot of barriers to overcome. We have the injuries. We have the concussions. We have the doping. We have all of that. Um, so I think that for someone like me, keep looking at it critically and approaching it critically, but then kind of getting down at that grassroots level, talking to the participants and actually listening to the participants and reporting what the participants are telling you. I think that can change some things. I don't know that we're at a tipping point yet, but hopefully we'll, we'll be there soon. I don't know. Yeah, we're really dealing with uh, kind of a neoliberal approach to uh, to individual health, and and the fact that uh, a lot of people are interested in funding the connection research on the connection between uh, uh, sport and health because if if sport makes you healthy or physical movement makes you healthy, then uh, then you can you're responsible for for your health and. 
uh, and we won't have uh, as many uh, healthcare problems in terms of sustainability. And, uh, and also the politics of research here are really important. Uh, you know, Coca-Cola did one of the major studies on the connection between sport and health because uh, they didn't want a connection between drinking sugary drinks and health. So they thought they they said if you if you participate enough in sport, then you can drink all the coke you want. And uh, and the person who did that, the University of Colorado at Boulder, now no longer has a job. But there's there's research like that going on, and, and we, so we've got to be skeptical about about some of the research related to the area that Stacy's talking about. I, I did want to ask a question to Nikki and Manuela uh, about how they've dealt with welcomeness issues, inclusion issues, uh, diversity issues in Italy. Is that is that something that that you're uh, that you've thought about? We we feel like uh, the place we, we are not to be here because you you're talking a lot about research and research and observa observations and that's the way in Italy we, we live a, a pretty different opposite situation and uh, the, the work on, on the singles are uh, affiliated from the single from the single professor from the single coach but uh, uh, the poverty uh, in Italy um, change the mentality, no? Uh, we cannot share. We, 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 we think about our garden and uh, we defend it. So uh, it is only uh, work with love, you know? We, 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 we have to believe. We want to believe. And we, we, we uh, start to annoying about that. It's very hard. It's very hard, and, and also um, the, the childhood, the the, the adolescents uh, feel it because adults are more or less uh, big, you no? Know? But the the the, the, the yacht feel a lot. So it's very very hard to 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 make practice about it. But we want to use the this research from you, from the US and from all over the world to, to, to put in practice it and uh, we need creativity uh, for that. Hopefully we can help you out over time. <laughs> I hope so, very good. <laughs> so, uh, in, I, I'd like, is there another question? <laughs> Hey, Jason Lupo, uh, Full Armor Sports. We're a local uh, grassroots organization here in Colorado Springs. I actually graduated from UCCS with a degree in sport management and sport conditioning, um, and then found a passion in youth sports, so went on to Clemson to get a master's in youth development leadership. And um, so my question is kind of towards Stacy. You uh, briefly mentioned nicknames in, in your presentation, and then Nikki and Manuela mentioned um, breaking their kids into the, houses, per se. Um, not super familiar with Harry Potter, but there seems to be this uh, growing trend of the programs that are really successful are allowing people to put their identity within the programs. I think we see that in CrossFit, we see that in certain sports programs. Um, have you found anything that, that shows that there's a link between retention and forming that identity within the group? And is that something that we need to look for in building grassroots programs and not just these programs that drop your kids off, play the sport, and leave? Do we really need to focus on building community within our programs for them to be successful in grassroots sports? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I, my previous research was really on sport and sense of community, and there was direct relationships to that and participant retention. If people feel like they're a part of a community, it relates a lot to what Tommy talked about, that welcomeness, they're probably conceptual cousins, sense of community and welcomeness there's a direct relationship to participant retention. And yeah, I've got, I've got a decade's worth of research that, um, that kind of looks at sense of community kind of being that 
that element that if we can put that in our sports systems, they'll be better off. Uh, maybe I'll jump in here too, uh, since I didn't get to weigh in on the um, the health uh, question and angle, because um, uh, I think there's some connections uh, to be made. Uh, first off, uh, in my sense of NIH and a number of other uh, you know primary sources of funding for for health resource uh, research. Um, and a number of folks from the medical profession overall is, you know, the study of sport is viewed as, you know, serious science, uh, largely. Oftentimes, if you're looking at health benefits, uh, the focus tends now to be on physical activity, which, you know, is, is certainly important, and we're finding pretty consistent effects of, of physical uh, activity, but using accelerometers or, you know, being able to do body measurements uh, and the like is oftentimes not practical for studying sports at a large scale. So the, so the challenge then becomes to look at the connections between how we do sports and how we promote sport with how it's matched up to physical activity. And of course, you know, getting the evidence and research about the type of sport and the commitments of sports, the welcomeness and attachment and cultures around sports, you know, are important steps uh, in order to make those links because, you know, undoubtedly, uh, whether you're active or not active in your in your sport participation or not involved in sports so overall whether you're watching and following sports or out participating uh, those are all linked to physical activity and health we just need to have better understanding of those processes and those effects and, and much yeah, much go ahead so I guess I got a follow-up question on that so with the United States and parks and rec sports being very prevalent in the YMCA and programs like that where they're run by city organizations, that might not be able to build that same sense of community, are we looking at sport, especially in the United States, from the wrong perspective as to where and who should be running these grassroots programs? Should that go back to the nonprofit, public, private side? I mean, what what area is it that's, that's doing this right? And should we rely on government organizations to necessarily provide those grassroots sports programs if they can't necessarily do the same thing in terms of building community? I think a big part of it is that the power needs to be returned to the participants for them to help define it, for them to develop the culture. And I think with organized sport and the professionalization and the commercialization of sport, we're moving more and more away from that. The more we can return control to the participants, I think the better off we'll be. Yeah, and, and we have to take into account the context within which that occurs. When you turn things over to the participants, and you have no public support in the provision of spaces and uh, good public transportation to get to and from, uh, maybe childcare associated with your involvement in a grassroots sport, uh, then what happens is, and, and we're living in the land of privatization here, uh, what happens is that over time, diversity goes down, inclusion goes down, and, and things get socioeconomically segregated, they get racially and ethnically segregated, and, uh, and oftentimes gender segregated. So, uh, so th those are issues that, that really have uh, strong uh, policy and, and governmental implications. So, uh, and also, when it comes to participation in grassroots sports, I'll, I'll return to um, Manuela and Nikki's presentation. Uh, how do you measure, and I'm wondering if Chris measured it, pleasure and emotion? Because there is growing information now about the association between not the old uh, no pain, no gain uh, approach to, to health and sport, where you just constantly push yourself to the point where sometimes you end up injured or whatever, uh, but you experience pain, and it's not a very attractive experience. Uh, and, and if you haven't met your goals for the day, you know, your number of whatever, steps, heart rates, whatever, uh, then you feel bad. So, so maybe there should be more of an emphasis on pleasure and emotion in connection with grassroots sports uh, if we want sustainable participation and, and positive health outcomes, but I'm wondering, is there, is there anything in your data to talk about that? Uh, well, I think a, a couple of things to comment on. Uh, there is some, although I wouldn't say that is necessarily a focus. I, I think the best places to find that information uh, is a series of questions we ask people why they participate in the sports that they participate in, right? And so then they give insight about what is meaningful and important to them 
about those uh, particular sport choices. And secondly, from the, from the opposite ang angle, essentially, we ask people why they stop participating in specifically organized sports. Uh, and again, you get uh, information and, and uh, reflections then of the context and, and experiences that they didn't appreciate. Uh, overall. Um, and the last thing I was going to add is uh, one, one term I heard that has always been, uh, I think, resonant with me uh, in thinking about especially uh, the commitment and motivation to keep up exercise routines. And I think it came from a fellow colleague at, at Ohio State, uh, in fact, that I saw in the news or uh, a, a write up on, on the research, but I'm not sure who the person is. But uh, she used the, the phrase pleasurable intensity, right? So this notion that you know, you don't want to push yourself so hard you're throwing up and you're sick and, uh, you know, in order to improve your health, but enough that it's enjoyable and you see uh, effects and you want to continue. And whether we're talking about playing uh, youth sports or, you know, pushing ourselves in our own exercise routine, I think that uh, that phrasing and also that concept is pretty useful. So, Simon, do you have, we've talked about all sorts of things and we've been skirting around your your topic, but what do you have to add to this? Apologies. Well, that is quite fine. It, it's, it's, as I said earlier, I'm uh, probably a bit of a not duck in this uh, session anyway. Uh, I can add, however, that health is one of the uh, 17 sustainable development goals. Uh, and as I was thinking, contemplating this, uh, again, going back to numbers, only four universities bother to, bother to currently offer graduate courses that are in some way related to health, even though 16 of the degrees, of the 84 degrees, have not necessarily Google either health or recreation incorporated in them. And so again, it simply seems that this is, uh, this is not a topic that seems to be resonating, at least among sport management educators. Um, for what it's worth, it is also a topic that is not required by uh, the Commission on the Accreditation of uh, Sport Management Programs, so perhaps it would be time uh, for you know, some uh, accreditors, some decision makers there to kind of uh, change one of the th some of the things that they do. Yeah. So, other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Alex from the University of Colorado Boulder campus. Um, this is mostly for Thomas, but anyone else can jump in. Um, appreciate most of these talks. Um, I feel like inclusivity and welcomeness is very important. Um, but one thing that wasn't brought up much, that Jay touched on it now, was economic ability. Um, so especially as all of us in the states know, um, socioeconomics are very much correlated with race in this country. So you have lots of schools that are disproportionately one race that have less money, can do then less you know, sports after school, they have to go home, help with work, their parents can't drive them to practice. I assume that impacts long-term performance. So what, if anything, can or should we do if we care about inclusivity and welcomeness, knowing that this economic background makes it so hard for so many people to participate? Right, and then you have a system in which the US underfunds physical education now, so we don't have that in our schools anymore, so it perpetuates it, especially in the low SES, urban uh, elementary school systems, etc. Um, so it's a continued effort, right, because the, the one study that I briefly mentioned in the intro, we looked at, if you didn't play early, you don't play late at all. And so youth participation predicts adult participation on a very large level. So we've set up a system in which it's not sustainable in terms of those populations. I don't have answers or ways to fix it um, other than fixing our education system, which if I did that, then you know, <laughs> I'd be a superstar. Um, so that, that's, a, that's part of the challenge of it. Um, definitely the wealthiness and some of the things that Chris has mentioned as well comes into play in those categories because it's not just about feeling welcome. You still have to have the ability to do it, but then you also have to have the access to do it and perceive that you should be doing it. Um, and as you mentioned, after school programs and things like that tend to um, get minimized. Um, before I moved here, I was creating a run club for an underprivileged um, school and originally I wanted to target high school, and they said, no, they're already done. You can't, you can't get to them. You have to start at best middle school because the high school students 
already are working after school, or they're taking care of their younger siblings, or cousins, or you know, working so their grandmother can support the kids and things like that. So there is this definite system that creates an extreme challenge within those populations for sure. Yeah, Eric? Hi, Eric Wilson, uh, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. As for Tommy, would you expect your results to remain consistent across esports? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know esports well enough. I still don't understand it, but um, in terms of why people want to watch it, but. Um, I don't know, in terms of just visual and what I've seen, it tends to be, in terms of the elites, they tend to be of Asian descent. Um, so I don't know what youth participation is like and things like that, but in terms of the goals and outcomes we would want to achieve, I would not incorporate esports into that at all. Because um, it's a sedentary activity and it's not, there's no physical or health or any real benefit to it other than maybe some emotional, I guess. You can get some use stress and escapism in that maybe, but I would rather them play active Harry Potter than some video games. Yeah. Yeah. So eSports e obviously, uh, uh, at the competitive level, the eSports e competitions are male dominated. Uh, there's a large component in the United States of Asian American participants globally, right, not Asian American, but Asian participants, and globally, uh, uh, South Korea is is the leader in terms of of esport participation. But video gaming generally is half women, half men, and uh, and the problem is that the people who have designed those games have designed them with young men in in mind. And uh, we don't have games that, that uh, have come out of values and experiences that a lot of girls and young women grow up with. But, uh, but those, those games are, are now starting to be created uh, because universities in the UK are offering majors now in esports and part of, those ma part of that major is related to designing games. And designing the music for the games and character uh, uh, appearance for the games and so on. So there are plenty of there are plenty of ways to be inclusive when it comes to video gaming in general. Esports, I think we're going to have to be much more intentional uh, to to get any kind of, of equal representation across various demographic groups and national groups. There, uh, esports also is highly socioeconomic dependent. So you need, uh, for the actual esport games, you need access to some heavy duty equipment. Yeah. The, the, oh, that was, that was great. That was yeah. absolutely spot on. Yeah. yeah. So if there are no more questions, I thank you for attending and. And certainly our panelists will be around if you want to uh, ask them more about what they're doing. Thank you very much.